we're going to end up with Graham over there. Semicircle this way. Semicircle. The center? The center? We're going to be over there. Because we have the, we're recording, so the, the camera's up there. Right. So that's why we're going to have you uh, over to the side. Yeah, and you're not in the circle to start, right? So. No, no, no. no. I close the circle. Close the circle. Solid. Okay. And not yet. Come over here, Andrew. Yeah. There we go. Finally, we 
we have Florius, which is sort of an exhibit of technational in France. It was written sometime after 1409, we can assume from the text, because it speaks of Theory posthumously. It is written in poor Latin and drawn in color, but with more difficult to interpret images. And that is all that I know of the name Chris. Oh, the story from there. Okay. Um, and so why did we add silver into our studies? We studied George Silver because he provides useful language that we can use to describe martial combat in general, and specifically describe the place of Fiori Oberius and provide some context and sense to um, what these plays that Fiori has described. Okay, so tell us, just give us what we need to know about Silver, the, what do you mean by the true fight, and what are his details? Um, so, George Silver talks about the four principles that we use, the true fight, true time, and the grounds and governors. The principle of the true fight is to strike without being struck. Uh, true time is movement, uh, presenting a threat before you present a target. As he describes, it is time with a hand, body, foot, feet. So an example, if I throw a cut, I move the time of my hands, body, foot, and feet. Um, false time would be anything other than that order. So a very egregious example of false time would be movement with the feet, foot, body, and then hands. So for nearly that entire action, you're presenting your own body as a target before you present anything your opponent needs to do. He also speaks of the grounds, which can be thought of as things you need to know before the fight. They are judgment, distance, time, and place. Judgment being your ability to judge the appropriate distance from your opponent, which you can strike without being struck, from where you can determine the appropriate time to strike the opponent without being struck, and then from those two, you can determine the place on your opponent that you can strike without being struck. The governors can be thought of as using the grounds actively in the fight. They are judgment, measure, pressing in and flying out, where judgment incorporates all of the grounds in one, being able to create an effective measure between you and your opponent, so understanding where you can strike your opponent and also where your opponent can strike you actively in the fight and moving back and forth. And when you can determine an appropriate measure, you can tell when it's safe to press in, so to attack your opponent when you see an opening, as well as when you should fly out if a threat is presented to you. Uh, pressing in and flying out are part of the twofold mind, which should always be active in your thoughts at all times. Um, because going back to the, um, to the principle of the true fight, you must strike without being struck. So even if you have a target that you can strike, you must be able to fly out so as to not be struck while striking. Okay. Um, and back to Fiore a little bit. So could you describe to us the Senio page up there and its significance? Sure. So up there is the Senio page. Um, in the center of the image, there is a man who could be thought of as the archetypal swordsman, uh, Nicola Deste, Fiore, the reader himself. Um, any interpretation seems to be valid. Um, around that figure are seven swords representing the six cuts and thrust up the center or punta. Um, the cuts are pendente and of time on the left and right. Around these swords are the four attributes of swordsmanship that Fiore discusses. Uh, they're represented by animals holding specific objects. So at the top is the lynx, representing prudencia, or prudence, or what George Silver might say would be judgment. Um, the lynx is holding calipers. At the right hand is the tiger, representing celeritas, or speed, it's holding an arrow. The left hand is a lion holding a heart, representing audacia, or audaciousness, or courage. And at the feet is an elephant, representing fortitudo, or stability. Um, and on its back is an entire castle, because it is so stable. Uh, Fiore states that Audacia is the most important attribute, because without Audacia, you cannot do any of the other attributes effectively. Okay. Okay. I think we've covered the theory. Any other questions? Okay. Well, we do, you're going to say some more about the, uh, uh, the targets of that. Um, okay, you can put your sword down. Alright, footwork. 
Okay, can you um, describe to us the footwork that Fiore describes and show us? I can. <laughs> so Fiore describes three turns. There's the mezzo volta, the tuta volta, and the volta stabile, which is a stable turn. So again, a mezzo volta, or half turn, tuta volta, or full turn, and volta stabile. Also discusses the accrescimento and decrescimento, so increasing and decreasing steps and traversing steps for the risk of possible side. Okay, can you just do some footwork as well to show those steps, however you like? So we're going to um, start doing some questions all right. Could you first go, what are we, oh, 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 question? Uh, yeah, um, yeah, hold on, I'm going to get to that. Can you just start with the question? Can you describe to us what Fiori says about the requirements of wrestling? Sure, so Fiori says there are eight requirements of wrestling, which is knowledge of advent, oh, sorry, uh, strength, speed, then knowledge of advantageous grapples and binds, including locks, breaks, keys, dislocations, and throws, um, as well as the strikes of malice. So strikes to the soft targets on the opponent, such as the eyes, throat, ears, nose, groin, floating ribs, kidneys, etc. Okay. All right. We should do those posters, though. So let's see the poster of our Sure. Uh, so first, you have two to four to pedal, or pull and gate, which is the relaxed in the center. From Kale, Four is two. Longer. Okay. Is there a relationship between any of them that you describe? Cool. Yeah, so he describes the low posta and the high posta as countering each other, so full iron gate and compelling as opposing each other, as well as the extended posta and retracted posta. Also counter each other. Okay. Can you do a little bit of your footwork drill bite and also be changing posta? And you are monitoring your yep. trigger level. Oh, yeah. Okay, so uh, we would like to see the first six plays. So I'll have you direct uh, Jordan to do what you need to show them. Okay? okay. Uh, if you can grab me by the back of my head with your left hand, please. 
into a first strike to do it. So first I block his strike. I see that I can get a straight arm. So first play, you regain your fortitude and roll his arm. Second play is stepping through. Try to break the arm or go ahead. Can you do that one again, please? Alternatively, instead of stepping through, so again, I can step up and step around. If you attack me again, please, do third play. If I can't get a straight arm, or so we're too close, I decide not to, or he's much stronger than I am, I can do a third play, or you strike the face and step behind the right leg. One more time, please. Fourth play, you can grab me again, but with your feet uh, no way around. So, yeah. So instead of third play, I can do a shear, where I twitch his skin and grab behind his elbow, pushing through in between his legs. Uh, just one more time. Yeah, so fifth play, it's very similar. If you can grab me with your left foot forward. I push through, and instead of pushing in between his legs, I can step behind his leg and do the same, the same motion for myself. So what determines what you're doing in those last two? In the last two, the only thing that changes between my actions and grab me if his left foot is forward, I'll step through behind his left leg. If his right foot is forward, I can't get the left leg, so I step through, kick him in the nuts, and then throw him. So it's, it's the same, without somebody there, you really can't tell which tier is being performed. Um, and then finally, is the elbow push. So this can't be used as a counter to back play or whatever an elbow from you can push. Okay. Which goes across, I believe, every section of Fiore. If an elbow is present, push it, turn your opponent. I didn't 
jury verdict striking is used to distract your opponent or stun him long enough so he can perform a more effective finishing move, such as breaking his arm, throwing him to the ground. Um, striking is, except for one wrestling play, I think, never used as a as an actual play. It's always as a lead up to something. Like in dagger, you make a cover, strike him so he can't respond, perform your play. Cool. It's, it's used to gain time. Thank you. Thank you. When you're breaking someone's balance in what direction, how do you know in which direction to perform the cheer in order to break the ah, So we push the opponent towards their weak triangle. So if you can imagine in our in our stance, which is a, a very upright stance, I'm not sure if I said that before. Uh, you have four points, you have both feet and two points out in front and behind your opponent. Um, these can be seen as a weak triangle. This is a strong triangle. Where if you try to push your opponent this way, it can resist very well. Or this way, it can resist with your legs. We're pushing against the weak triangle either this way or that way. You move their ability to balance themselves without changing position. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay, Andrew. You need a uh, stagger. So 
So I'm going to just start at the top. We're going to do Fedete, Mandrina, Satani, and Reversi, and just go around the clock a couple of times. Okay? Ready, Graham? those things, I would look at, or rather feel, um, the energy that my opponent is giving me. Um, generally, throws are either pushing towards me or pulling back. Uh, disarms generally are staying still, because they've attacked and chosen not to continue moving. Um, breaks are usually pushing through, and uh, disarms are staying still. Oh, so what, keys are pulling back. What do we use in Guelph to sort of be able to manipulate that yourself, not just feel what they want to do. Um, what do we generally do after we make the cover? After we do the cover, we generally put force into the cover and can sort of impose their own will on how it's Through what? On the further section. Show me the first defense, the very first thing. Okay. What's your right hand do? Oh, my right hand is striking. That's right. We strike. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we strike them, especially to come to the injury again. For me, it's 
especially do in a play where you go underneath his entire arm and come around to do the throwing towels while softening him up a little bit first. And then step all the way underneath. Okay. Uh, the feet. Uh, we're going to do more questions. Yeah, we got two more sections to do. Is that uh, this section? Yeah. Okay. In an ideal world, what part of the arm is the cover against the uh, defendant? The defendant? Yeah. Uh, part of my hands, uh, if your hands in a V shape, so the strike is coming. Sorry, sorry, the measure, the measure. Oh, the measure. Uh, usually at, right at the wrist of the dagger, so you can tackle slowly. So it's coming up and covering here, so you can't get a dagger around my arm. Yeah, and it's a strong strike, preferably pushing it on the back of it, so that you can have as much strength to follow. Makes all my coverage. Ha, <laughs> 
Feel free to strike me too, I'm sure he deserves it. Thank you. 